Welcome back. It's time once again for the iPhotography Podcast. My name is Stephen. If you've not joined us before, thank you so much for coming along uh, and watching or listening to this show, whether you're catching us as a podcast or you're seeing me on YouTube. Um, thank you so much either way. Um, so today, it's just not a long podcast necessarily. This, I'm going to go through about floral photography because it's an area of photography that I really, really love. I love kind of getting out into the garden, going out into woodlands, and photographing kind of seasonal flowers, etc. So if it's something of interest to you, then I've just got a few little tips just about how you can kind of approach that type of photography a little bit more kind of uh, coherently, how you can maybe get slightly more unusual images, something a little bit more kind of dramatic necessarily, because it's sometimes hard with static objects such as flowers, or products to to kind of make something a little bit more unusual when you know it's not necessarily moving for you so I'm trying to kind of put together a few different tips that you can kind of do with your composition or with your camera settings just to make things a little bit more interesting and a little bit more eye-catching so with that said you know these are practical you can use these in your garden you know if you're going out into woodland or to to out into parks or whatever as well you can kind of always practice these tips or even if it's a case of you getting down to your local florist and just picking up a bunch of uh, you know flowers whatever's in season and just practice them within your living room and your kitchen this all can be done so it's kind of quite accessible so effectively with florals I think one of the biggest things is to avoid from photographing under strong daylight so if you're out kind of peak day you know one o'clock two o'clock and the sun's out there's no clouds you're going to get this very very heavy quality of light which casts a lot of shadows which with flowers be given that they're very very delicate as a subject what you want is a very delicate style of lighting to really kind of enhance the features and all the, the details within them so soft light would do that better than hard light so it kind of gives you a little bit more in the way of texture. So it's not going to be um, giving you these very, very heavy shadows that hard light would. So trying to avoid photographing under those types of conditions is really, really kind of helpful. Saying that, you could be going out at that same type of day, but if it's overcast, you won't necessarily have the worry of a strong daylight. So whatever it is in terms of the time of day that you're shooting, just make sure that you've got a bit of cloud cover. Obviously, if you're shooting indoors, you're not necessarily going to have that worry. But if you are still using natural light, even if you're indoors, you've just got to make sure that, that quality of light isn't too heavy and it's just a bit softer. So that's kind of one of the first tips I would ever say. Depth of field is another one. Because this is something that, again, to emphasize a softness that goes alongside that delicate floral, whatever type of flower you're photographing, to use the right camera settings to emphasize that kind of softness is really important. So with depth of field, as you know, if we're using a wider aperture, we can get a shallower depth of field. So that means a smaller area of focus. So if our flower itself is very, very small, very petite, anything in front of it and behind it after we've set our focus is pretty much going to be out of focus itself. So we just want to isolate that one flower, or maybe it's a couple of flowers depending upon what you're photographing. But effectively, that is just what's going to be sharp and everything else will be blurred. So that isolation can really, really help, especially if you've got lots of flowers around and maybe that you've got some roses, you've got some begonias, you've got some lilies, and you just want to focus on the rose. This is a really, really nice way of isolating one subject and making all the other ones a little bit blurred. So shooting around about anywhere between kind of f2.8, f4, maybe 5.6 at a push is going to give you that shallower depth of field so you can get that nice area of depth of field, um, sorry, that nice area of focus and those blurred areas around them as well. So you can do that with most cameras. I would say if you've got a camera with a kit lens, they probably stop down to around about 3.5 f 3.5 at the widest point um, so you can use something like that and then you may need to get quite close in and you can kind of crop it afterwards as well if you find the shots a little bit too wide um, when it when you're looking back on it in editing the third tip this is something that's probably going to be more prevalent for when you're shooting outdoors um, is the wind because obviously given the delicacy of flowers they're going to move like many, many objects in the in the wilderness would do. So if you ever photograph trees and long grasses, you know you've got to make sure that you're capturing um, you know, a nice level of detail. You don't want too much in the way of blur that actually goes within the photograph itself. So when you are photographing outside, if it's a little bit windy, either you can do two different things. 
you can try and shield the direction of the wind away, away or just shield it from your flower itself. So if it's coming in and if you're able to actually position yourself so you can actually have the wind hitting your back and basically kind of going around you, you may be able to shield and protect the flower and it may not move that much. If that's going to be a tricky thing, if it's going to be impossible, if you're going to get in the way of the light at the same time, then don't do that. Don't make the, the image suffer in terms of the light. Um, just to protect it from the wind. Alternatively, what you could do, and what you probably should do, is actually raise your shutter speed. So if you were shooting at, say, 125th of a second, and you've got a little bit of movement in there. Now, depending upon how much wind there is, how strong it is, how much movement's going on, that will determine how quick a shutter speed that you need. But if effectively, if you double it, maybe go to like 250th to maybe 400th of a second, you know, if it's kind of a light breeze and it's obviously swaying, that should be enough to kind of still give you the clarity um, without capturing any motion blur. But it's always worthwhile reviewing your images afterwards just to make sure that's the case. So if you kind of look back on your picture on the screen, use a magnifier, get a little bit closer in and just check the edges of the flower. That's gonna be the most obvious area where you're gonna get any way of motion blur. It's not the center of it, you're gonna notice more so at the edges because that's where those kind of petals are the thinnest and that's where they'll flap a little bit more so it's where you potentially get that blur. So kind of shielding the uh, the flower from the wind again is another, another good point. Bokeh. Bokeh, okay, is tip four. So use it to your advantage and it's not necessarily background bokeh. So as we were talking about before and using a shallower depth of field, it's also kind of quite a good thing to maybe look for foreground uh, bokeh. So again, you can still focus on your subject, you know, the particular flower that you're wanting to shoot. But then maybe if you've got a couple of other flowers that you can kind of actually bring into frame, how about bringing them further around the front? So this is more of a creative idea about something you can do in the way of composition. Whether you can bring one or two flowers in the front and look as if you're shooting through those flowers to see something else in the background. So whatever it is that you can actually find to actually bring into the foreground can just give you that sense of depth because you can have that blur at the front, then you can have your flower in focus, and then you can have blur in the background there. And that kind of encapsulation, it just isolates your subject a little bit more, which can be great if you've got a big wild garden of lots of different flowers and you just want to hone in on one. So think about foreground bouquet. It's not always just the background. Now, the next tip I would have for you is about the right choice of lens. You'd imagine with um, with floral photography, you could probably use a kit lens, you could probably use a prime, which is all very, very true, but macro lenses are really going to be the best. Now, kit lenses will get you, you know, somewhere or another in terms of getting a decent image, but if you really, really want to kind of hype your game up, get a little bit of a better quality image, get something with an exceptional sharpness, then looking for a dedicated macro lens would be great. Somewhere between about 60 mil, 100 mil, I think would be more than adequate. Obviously one that again covers uh, standard one-to-one -one magnification. So what you're actually seeing on screen represents how it is in real life. I think that's kind of quite important. Um, lenses with uh, image stabilization, lenses and cameras with image stabilization is very, very helpful when you're working with such delicate little features like that. And also look out for uh, fast prime lenses as well. Like we talked about before, having a wider depth of field is always very, very helpful. So if you can find a macro that goes down to about f2.8 or stops open to f2.8, I think that will be a very, very kind of good port of call in terms of investing money if you really love macros. Now, obviously macros, it doesn't, it's not just the case that you can only photograph florals with it. You know, you can use it in so many different situations as well. So don't just see it as a kind of a, a one trick pony type of thing. But if you certainly do, you know, if you've got a lovely garden and you love taking photographs of flowers, and even the insects and wildlife that you have out in your garden, a macro lens could be a really, really good choice to invest in. So have a look at something like on that. And don't think you always have to either go for a lens that matches up to your manufacturers. So if you have a Canon camera, don't think you've got to get a Canon macro, though they do obviously work very well together. There's some third party lenses that you can get, whether it be Tamron, Sigma, loads of different ones that, you know, can match up to other bodies. Um, and they are oh, they're just as good. I've, I've got personally a, um, no, it's not a macro, it's a 16 mil Sigma lens um, that fits on my camera, fits on my Sony camera. Man, it's absolutely brilliant. I think if I if I bought the equivalent in Sony, I would have probably paid twice the price for it. Um, but certainly the image quality, I can't fault from it. So looking at third party lenses, I, I always kind of advocate. So that's a great thing to do. So another tip, this is maybe 
an indoor and an outdoor trick that you can use either way. But either way, it's brilliant to use in the summer. If you find you're having a bit of a drought and you want to capture it, um, floral images with a little bit more texture, just getting yourself a simple spray bottle from the kitchen, filling up with water, and then just giving the flowers a bit of a blast. It adds, obviously, that level of texture with those water droplets. Now, you've got to be kind of set up with the camera already because the water droplets may just run off the surface of the flowers um, as quick as you put them on there. So you almost have to be shooting and spraying at the same time. But it's a really, really nice kind of little effect that you can add. And just adding those little elements, those water droplets, as they kind of fall off the edge of the petals, they can make absolutely beautiful images when shot with a macro lens. So kind of keep an eye out or even if it's just natural, you know, if it's getting to the spring or the, um, the winter time and you've had a little bit of rain overnight, if you're getting out early enough, you may be able to kind of capture that morning dew as it's rolling off the edge of these petals and leaves. Definitely worth looking out for that. And my last tip is about black and white. Now, I appreciate florals do look amazing in color and they will nine times out of 10 probably be better for color, given that's what the iconic nature of that, that flower is. You know, you wanna have a red rose looking red, but think about monochrome for a little bit. Now, I'm not gonna say it's gonna work every time, but it's worth exploring the alternatives. With the ease of editing these days, it is so, so simple just to flick from color to black and white and just to check. You may just need to adjust contrast a little bit more, you may need to bring down the shadows a little bit further if you wanted to create more of a, of a darker, kind of a more moodier atmospheric style to make it look more like fine art as opposed to kind of a candid capture of a floral. But that's one thing kind of I would say a lot of the time is just to kind of double check that your image doesn't work better or as well in black and white as it would be with color. So even though florals typically, generally, you know, you know stereotypically, let's say, will look best in color, give it a try in black and white and see what you come out with. Because I've photographed, to say, florals for a long, long time. And yeah, I will fully agree, they do generally look better in color, but there is some instances where I've taken them in black and white and it's just brought out that extra level of texture and detail, which is beautiful. But if you've got any other tips about floral photography, if it's something you really enjoy and you want to get in touch and talk about a little bit further, I would love to hear from you. So please do. You can find us all over social media. You can drop us a message on our podcast now. Um, and you can always get in touch with us on email, which is tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. If you want to know a little bit more about iPhotography in general, you can find us online iPhotography.com forward slash podcast. We've got loads of offers on there for our photography courses. So if you want to know a little bit about photography itself, if you've bought yourself a new camera and you want to know how it works, then get in touch and you can start on one of our courses. You can learn about wedding photography. You can learn about portraiture, creative light tricks, landscapes, astro, Photoshop, Lightroom. There's pretty much everything that we can kind of think of there that we've covered one way or another in our courses. And there's also our memberships as well, where you can get continuous photography training for myself and the rest of the iPhotography team. But if you hit that link, iPhotography.com forward slash podcast, you can find out more. But thank you very, very much for listening for uh, this week's podcast. Please check out any of the previous episodes if you haven't listened to any of them already. There is more to come coming up next week. In the meantime, thank you very, very much. Bye for now.